Hey, it's Mike here, and today we're gonna look at a spread of new vegan studies that on their own really don't need an entire video. Not quite interesting enough, but if we tape them all together, combine them through teamwork, then we get an interesting video. We have a trial comparing vegan to non-vegan diets in terms of muscle training and fat loss. We also have a new Barnard study on toxins, as well as another study on toxins comparing even vegans to raw vegans who's more pure. We also have a colorectal cancer survival study, and we have multiple studies looking at B12 levels and some other nutrients in a vegan, so let's just get into it. Now for the first and most important one, well, it's not a full study, it is in Nature's Biotech Journal, and it is just news, but the title is Spanish Tortillas Go Vegan. We were on the fence for a while, but we decided to flat out go vegan. Have you ever seen a tortilla do flamenco? Well, we don't have the budget for that anyway. <laughs> in this case, the company Every is using precision fermentation, which I just did an entire video on, to create ovalbumin, which is a egg protein, and in this case, it is going to be used in traditional Spanish omelet style tortillas from a Spanish food company. But I wanted to add that because I talked about precision fermented products of all sorts, dairy proteins, etc. but did not mention egg ones. That is happening. Anyway, let's get on to the first actual study. And this is an interesting one from Dr. Neil Barnard and his colleagues were talking about a randomized control trial that compared a low fat vegan diet to a Mediterranean diet. We've seen a few results from this study and they've gone back and looked at the advanced glycation end products, which is essentially a toxic or potentially harmful product that is created by mixing sugars and fats or proteins, and it ages you, causes inflammation, is implicated in various diseases, and in this case, it's a randomized crossover trial, so they randomized people to either start on a vegan or Mediterranean diet, and then they had a washout period or a break, and then they switched diets, and the results are frankly quite amazing in terms of AGE intake from this chart. You can see that each time, a group goes on that vegan diet, you just have a massive drop in the intake of those AGEs. And what's more crazy is that there was no improvement on the Mediterranean diet. You can just see the AGE intake shoot right back up or start high on the Mediterranean diet. And the study says that in particular, dietary AGEs decreased by 73% in the vegan diet. Again, no change in the Mediterranean diet. Oh, and they also had the added benefit of a six kilogram or 13 pound weight loss. And so where are these AGEs coming from? Well, they say in particular, we're seeing about 40% coming from meat, 27% coming from the consumption of added fats, and 14% coming from dairy products. And the acronym is AGE because they drive aging. And perhaps this is somewhat connected to that recent Stanford twin study follow-up, which found several lower aging markers in the twins that were put on a vegan diet compared to those on a quote, healthier omnivorous diet. I have a whole video on that too. So AGEs is a toxin that just apparently looks better for a vegan diet here, but we have another study coming up, which has sort of mixed results for vegans. And that is the toxin acrylic. Acrylamide. acrylamide is also formed when cooking and oftentimes potatoes that are browned is like the highest. And the concern with acrylamide is that it could be carcinogenic. From the FDA, while well, human studies have been inconsistent on this, there are various organizations that still put it as like a probable carcinogen to be safe. And this study looked at acrylamide metabolites in urine and the blood, and it found that vegans were a little bit higher than meat eaters, but then those raw vegans were just way down there in terms of their levels. So raw vegans, I know I give you crap for like not eating enough food and often not caring about science, but in this case, I'm giving you the win. <laughs> but I do believe this is a problem where a lot of times vegans are going to restaurants or whatever, and one of the main options there is gonna be some heavily cooked or fried potato dish or French fries, etc. And so I think that vegans might be over consuming that a bit, but thankfully there are some cool ways around this from this study. If you use a rosemary powder to cook potatoes, you can see about a 94% reduction in acrylamide levels compared to controls. And then this can happen to a lesser extent in wheat related products, but this study cooked wheat biscuits with various antioxidant rich plant foods and you know certain berries were again in the 90 plus percent reduction range. 
elderberries in particular did quite well. But back to those potatoes, yeah, I think the default should be cooking these potatoes with rosemary or some other antioxidant rich plant that's shown to lower it. You can also be exposed to acrylamide from smoking. People just aren't aware at how widespread smoking and vaping still is. I mean, from this NIH report, 37% of high school seniors had vaped in the last year, and 25% of that was just for flavor, which brings me to today's sponsor, Fume. Fume is a flavored air device, and flavored air is a leading alternative to smoking and vaping. And this guy right here is zero nicotine, does not require batteries, does not use vape or smoke. It's flavored air which is delicious. And speaking of flavors, they have a ton of flavors to choose from here, and I've still been loving the mint. So this is a great way to combat an oral fixation as well as just a cool fidget toy. You can rotate it on this base as well, which is super fun. You can also chew and fidget with the topper, which is a soft mouthpiece that you can get for free if you get the journey pack by going to tryfumefum.com and using the code MikeTheVegan or just using this QR code. And Fume has served over 300,000 people and I personally think it makes a great present for people who might need that, might wanna become the next success story. All right, back to the video. And next we have a very interesting randomized control trial. And this is unique in that it had four arms. They didn't just split people into two groups. They actually had two vegan groups and two meat eating groups. One of each was a control and the other one had added exercise. And this is a case, it wasn't a super long study. So the results weren't very dramatic, but we still did see that the vegan exercise group lost the most fat. Uh, they lost more fat than the meat eating exercise group, for example. And well, they actually trended with a little bit more lean mass, 0.4 kilograms versus 0.25, that wasn't statistically significant, but hints at a potentially higher muscle growth. And it also reminds me of a somewhat recent other trial that was just a vegan versus non-vegan group given a workout plan and they looked at muscle protein synthesis, et cetera, and they found that there was no difference in terms of muscle mass gained. However, in one exercise, the inclined bench, the vegan protein group actually had more gains to a statistically significant extent as this chart shows. So again, age of the swole vegans, but tangent over, let's move right on. The next one we have is this colorectal cancer survival study. And while they weren't looking at groups of vegans versus non-vegans or whatever, they did look at a plant-based diet index. And I do think the results are still pretty dramatic. And we're talking about people with metastatic colorectal cancer Cancer that has spread past their colon. And in this case, the people who had the higher plant-based diet index had a 24% better survival. This is pretty big since over 50,000 people in the US alone die from colorectal cancer each year. So if simple math applies, which it really never does, but if it did, then we could be talking about like 12,000 less deaths in this case. If people had a higher plant-based intake anyway, and now we'll get into the sort of blood markers of various nutrients on a vegan diet. And the first one that we have is on young people out of Norway. And this one looked at a bunch of different markers, looked at various diets. We're talking, you know, pescatarian, flexitarian, vegetarian, vegan, and standard meat eater, and looked at a bunch of nutrients, but B12 is the one that I love to highlight here because we're just smashing the narrative over and over again that vegans are B12 deficient little weaklings. So as the study says, quote, all of the dietary groups had median methylmalonic acid levels, that's a superior B12 marker, indicating lower risk of B12 deficiency with no difference between groups. We just had one random pescatarian that looked at risk of deficiency, no vegans in the study were. And I really like how they for once framed this into the bigger picture of the research that we're seeing nowadays. They said that, yeah, our findings of adequate B12 intake are coherent with previous studies in German people, Norwegian people, et cetera. And they also mentioned that iron levels and intake were adequate, and they did look at a bunch of different nutrient intakes where the vegans sort of crushed here in terms of things like vitamin D. They did better than lacto-ovo-vegetarians. They did better than lacto-ovo-vegetarians and omnivores for selenium. They did do worse in terms of iodine, but you know, that was the one weak spot. Iodine also seems to be a concern in particular for European soil, not as much of a concern in the US. So European vegans get that nori seaweed, and then we also had better than lacto-ovo-vegetarian and flexitarian for B12. And then vegans were seven times better than omnivores for the amount of people not getting enough vitamin C, crushing it or squeezing it, as he would with an orange. 
And they did something that I haven't seen much before, and that is just looking at all of the diets together and nutritional literacy, looking at high, medium, and low and seeing the nutritional intakes across those groups. Very interesting stuff. And they found that, for example, energy adjusted intake of high versus low knowledge was higher for vitamin A or retinol equivalents, folate, vitamin D, vitamin C, and iron compared to people with lower knowledge. And that one wasn't vegan specific, it was just all diets, but still really interesting to show that it helps to know more about nutrition in terms of getting nutrients. Who would have thought? But then again, the vegans did quite well here. This is going into my new vault of vegan studies. I'm making a sort of master list here. I'm building it out. Hopefully one day I'll be able to share it. Another one that's definitely going in is this new meta-analysis that looked at B12 levels in all of these different Adventist studies that are out there, and the results are once again good. They say, quote, Adventists following a vegan or vegetarian diet did not demonstrate increased risk of vitamin B12 deficiency, you know, due to widespread consumption of fortified foods and supplements. And I was actually surprised to see this because a lot of the Adventist studies are a bit older, and it's really these newer studies where we're just seeing across the board great B12 status. And yeah, I do think a lot of this has to do with fortification for those that aren't supplementing, which is still some. And it is the case that a Polish study that was five years long put people on vegan diets with fortified foods and without fortified foods. And those in the fortified group hung in there. I think if there's a deliberate intention to eat fortified foods for B12, that you know that could make sense, but I still think it's way safer to just go with B12 supplements. You know, just get a multivitamin with them, really not hard. Another cool study is a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing soy milk versus cow's milk in terms of various health effects. And perhaps the main finding here is that soy milk was associated with lower LDL or bad cholesterol, which again is causal to atherosclerosis. And this is the case where we had a high certainty of evidence, which is something that you never see scientists say. It's like never good enough, but this was like four out of four stars essentially. And we also see some pretty good results for blood pressure and C-reactive protein, which is an inflammation marker in soy milk versus cow's milk. And this is a case where the study is actually saying, hey, people are trying to deem soy milk an ultra processed food, but that could unrightfully scare people away from consuming it when it clearly has healthier effects than a you know, minimally processed animal food known as milk, or as some call it, bovine lactation juice stolen from baby cows. Anyway, moving on. I do think a really important study that came out recently was that oil study. It took people and put them on a vegan diet that was either whole food without oil or whole food with extra virgin olive oil. I did a whole video on it, but I kind of wanted to do an update because one of the most heavily liked comments under that video was really denialist. It was like, oh, well, you know, because there was a lower calorie intake in the oil-free group, that could have been why the LDL was lower. That could have been responsible for all of the benefits that were seen. And I understand it was later in the video, but I had a whole section on the calorie difference and why I thought that was the case. And how, for example, oil is the single most calorie dense food that we consume at nine calories per gram. And so clearly there's gonna be a calorie difference that was caused by oil being consumed or not. So either way, oil was the factor that led to those results. And that does go to show that there is a practical difference in how people eat when they consume oil or they don't consume oil. And then of course, people were ignoring that there was a significant saturated fat increase with that 400 calories of extra virgin olive oil. And I think it's funny that I get one of the strongest negative reactions when I talk about how there could potentially be any negative effects of oil. And I am now at this point convinced that it's very similar to why people react so negatively when you tell them not to eat butter or other high fat animal products because it is like their single most calorie dense source of food and we are animals that are driven to consume calories we want to be getting calories and to be told that there might be an issue with your most dense source of food could trigger some emotional responses that then translate into the fingers on the keyboard and into my comment section. All right, rant over. In the end, I think all these studies were quite interesting between the advanced glycation and product trial with those Mediterranean versus vegan diets showing lower intake and the acrylamide data, as well as that colorectal cancer stuff, the B12 status and on and on. I think you know, mostly we're seeing 
a really good picture, learning a lot. We learned so much together today. And so while vegans across the board are doing quite well, I think the takeaways from this are, you know, if you're in Europe or anywhere, you know, why not put a little focus on getting that iodine in there, whether it's some seaweed or other sources. And then also that we should probably be cooking potatoes if we wanna brown the crap out of them with like rosemary powder or some other antioxidant as well. And again, back to that acrylamide and smoking and vaping and alternatives to that. Once again, if you are interested in Fume, this flavored air device. You can just click below, use the code MikeTheVegan at tryfume.com or the QR code and get that free topper. All right, that's it for today. Let me know down below what you thought about these studies, if there was anything I missed. As usual, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.